That's good. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Tom Flower. Hopefully you're picking up my screen right now. Um, I'm a instructor at Capilano University. Uh, my research is primarily focused on animal behavior research, uh, but more recently I've been trying to put my skills towards conservation biology for the obvious reason that we're losing biodiversity at a rate of knots. And very recently I was made a board member at the Wild Bird Trust um, largely because, like many of you, I imagine, I'd been down to Maplewood Flats Conservation Area and realised what a lovely little gem it was on the North Shore uh, with some really terrific habitat. And uh, the Wild Bird Trust is an excellent organisation, I found. I loved what they're doing with the local Slewa Tooth Nation as well and trying to integrate with that community. Um, and so I was really delighted to be able to join that work. Now, there's a lot of ongoing work to do with habitat restoration at the flats. And one component that we were a little unsure about was the wetlands. Some terrific work's been done by BCIT students in recent years, uh, indicating that there's some interesting stuff in there in addition to the amphibians, which we'd spotted. Um, so we wanted to go and get a better handle on this. And I'm just gonna briefly say a couple of things about why. First, we want to know whether it's a healthy wetland. And second, we can use that wetland health as an index really to assess the, the Maplewood Flats more generally. And the third thing was that wetlands are essential for the surrounding terrestrial environments. If you just think about all those insects, which all the birds are eating and other animals are eating, many of those, their nymphs and larvae live in the wetlands themselves. So having a healthy wetland at the um, Maplewood Flats conservation area is really critical to the broader terrestrial communities uh, which live there too. So um, with Maplewood Flats Conservation Area we, uh, and the, the, the Wild Bird Trust, we proposed a small student project for a Capilano student uh, to go and do this summer. Um, we managed to find an excellent student, Harrison Smith, who will be giving today's talk about the work he did to go and investigate the wetlands. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to Harrison. Um, thank you very much for all coming. We uh, hope you can join us, ask questions. Um, Probably leave that for a Q&A at the end, but if you have anything, jot it down in the chat as we go along. We'd be delighted to see your comments. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to Harrison. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate that intro. And uh, I'll start sharing my screen now so you guys can see. So hi, yes, my name's Harrison. Uh, I did a bit of work over the summer at the Maplewood Flats Conservation Area, and I'm here today to share with you guys what exactly I have been doing. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at Capilano University. I specialize personally in biology and anthropology. Uh, along here, uh, Tom, you know, he helped facilitate the project. He is a CAPU lecturer who mainly focuses on evolution and ecology. So first I'd like to talk about, about why wetlands are important. Um, you know, there are some key eco ecosystem functions that uh, wetlands perform that no other areas can do. And they support a lot of biodiversity through having a lot of heterogeneous habitats. And you know, 64% of wetlands worldwide have actually disappeared since industrialization. Um, another main function is, of course, as Tom mentioned, they provide uh, the aquatic environment for a lot of nymph and larval stages of different flying insects, as well as they just clean water. And you know, humans have massively reduced the wetlands. Uh, one major concern, of course, is through uh, agrochemicals that uh, agriculture, you know, has been spilling over and reducing the biodiversity that we do have. And in fact, the uh, Maplewood Flats Conservation Area is one of the last few remaining wetlands in Burrard Inlet. I think it actually might be the last remaining wetlands. And it, of course, has been majorly disturbed, but is on the up and up. So a little bit of an introduction about the site for those of you who have not been there. Uh, we primarily started, or we primarily we focused around the four wetlands. So I'll take you guys through them one by one. Uh, wetland one, of course, you can see there is at the uh, northernmost point. Um, it was mainly displayed, defined by its uh, lots of canopy coverage, has lots of uh, emergent vegetation, and there's actually been signs of some otter habitation there as well, which is very interesting. And it is also inaccessible by walking trail, so we hope that would be a little bit less disturbed. And then connect to wetland one, there's wetland two. Uh, through an in intermittent stream, it's connected. And it was defined primarily by uh, having median canopy coverage and is the smallest of the uh, four wetlands. 
and then connected to wetland two is wetland three via culvert that runs underneath a walking trail. Uh, it was defined primarily by its cattails and uh, its clear shallow streams that uh, ran through and underneath the culvert into wetland four. So as you can see, you can draw a line as it goes down. All four wetlands are connected. And so one aim of the project was to focus on how the wetlands change and how the communities in those wetlands change as we traverse down through them. And wetland four, I should also mention in previous research, has been called uh, the Southwest wetland and the large wetland or big wetland. And it was also defined as uh, having low canopy coverage. So it's very exposed to the sun. And uh, we'll see what, uh, what that affects later on in the presentation. So a little bit about the previous research. Uh, the Maplewood Flats Conservation Area has been an area of research for over 25 years. Uh, one of the oldest studies I could find was uh, back in 1994, uh, then Cap College. Some students at an environmental uh, restoration course or environmental uh, studies course uh, conducted some surveys about the debris pile and the barge channel and the salt marsh or mud flats there. And a more recent study that Tom alluded to that was uh, very helpful for our project was back in 2019, a bunch of BCI students, BCIT students doing a uh, environmental restoration course there conducted an amphibian survey and also they conducted an invertebrate survey. So it gave us a baseline and sort of something that we kind of looked at and also helped um, you know, lead us into lots of, lead us into the direction of lots of different resources that we use such as cabin, which I'll allude on a little bit later. And also one important note that we will come back to is the elevated copper levels that were found in uh, by this research team. So a little bit about the goals of the project. Uh, here we laid out the five that we really thought, uh, you know, as we were going into it that we really wanted to consider. So the first one is to inform our opinion on the invertebrate community, like what invertebrates are there? Um, what do they do? Like what tax are there? You know, what's the What's the uh, diversity like there? And then using that information, we would use it to uh, develop an invertebrate index of biological integrity or an IBI. We'd also like to promote wetland health and stimulate a prosperous uh, native ecosystem and really assess how changes in water quality affect the invertebrate populations. So I guess I should give a little bit of background in case anyone's unfamiliar with macroinvertebrates. But it's pretty much anything without a backbone that you can see like with your own naked eye. So here we have a photo of a fingernail clam uh, that I took myself that was very common in wetlands one and we'll see why in a second. But um, basically every single invertebrate that we have has a very specific tolerance range in which it can survive. And so that really leads us to believe or really like leads us to uh, you know certain questions about water quality and you know can inform our opinion about that. So what we want to do is use that information to develop an IBI, like I talked about, an index of biological integrity. However, or an IBI, I should explain, um, is how a humans impact the wetlands. However, there are some little caveats I should add. An IBI is primarily used on larger scale uh, systems, not as small as we have here. So uh, we'll come back to about how accurate it actually is, but it's just something to be careful and just remind you. So what type of wetlands are present? So we used uh, some cabin protocols, uh, which are uh, these protocols that Environment Canada releases about sampling from wetlands. And they have some different uh, criteria for what types of wetlands, such as like a swamp or a marsh or a fen. You know, we found that they're all shallow water pools at the Middle Flats Conservation Area. And um, then another question I wanted to ask is what invertebrates are present in each wetland and what tax are present? So another question we had was uh, how healthy are the wetlands? So I put healthy in quotation marks there because, you know, it's all relatively speaking, you know, it is a recovering environment and we don't have any original systems nearby that we can compare them to. So you just got to keep that in mind as well. And does a macro invertebrate IBI indicate pollution? You know, it's all about critically thinking when you're a researcher like this. So the last set of questions is, how does the invertebrate community change? You know, we see uh, some spatio-temporal changes. So how does it change as you transition from wetland one down to wetland four? And uh, how does uh, the temporal differences affect those invertebrates? So are the communities different? Do they change? Are they the same? 
you know, what sort of changes are we seeing? You know, are they more tolerant? Are they more sensitive? So, yeah. mm -hmm. so now moving on to the methods of our survey. So we connected uh, DIPNET surveys in each of the four wetlands twice. So we did one survey in early June and one survey in late June. Uh, within each survey, of course, we did four to five transects. So you can do the math. It's uh, something like 20 to 40, over like 40 transects that we ended up doing. And then in each of those transects, we, meant we identified all the invertebrates in each sample. So a little bit more onto the specifics of how we captured the invertebrates. We would go and we would uh, go into each wetland and we'd wait about into one meter of depth. And then we would sweep with our dip nets three times. So twice towards the bank and then once in a zigzagging motion. And then we would empty, empty those into our sample containers. And then we'd fill the sample containers with extra water to make sure that the invertebrates uh, had enough like water to swim around. And we would leave them on site and I would take my samples and I would go to the uh, greeter shack on site and I would sort them the very same day because it was very important to us as well that we try and minimize the stress that we put on these animals. And then so we'd return them immediately after we sound, uh, sorted and counted them. Uh, another bit of information we should also include here is uh, we conducted water samples as well. So prior to each survey, we conducted some water samples at each of the four wetlands. We collected uh, little containers and we sent them off to labs to be analyzed. So we get a better idea of what pollutants are in the water. And additionally with that, we also conducted uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, pH, conductivity, and temperature readings at each of the wetlands. So now once we have counted all of our bugs, it's good to get into the nitty gritty and all the math of it. So. Uh, if you're an ecologist, you'll recognize some Simpsons and Shannon's uh, diversity indexes. I won't get into all the details, but in essence, uh, Simpsons diversity index is measuring the abundance of a species in a community. And a Shannon's diversity index is measuring the abundance and evenness of a species in a community. So those are really two great indicators. And then we wanted something that was more macroinvertebrate specific. So we turned to a classic EPT, so if you're a stream ecologist, then you know everything about the, uh, make sure I don't mispronounce this, the ephemero pater, patera, which is a mayfly, lycoptera and trichoptera, which are stoneflies and caddisflies. So in high dissolved oxygen environments, we use this as primarily an indicator of stream health because those three have very specific tolerance ranges, which they can survive. So depending what the majority of the makeup of the stream is, then we can determine how healthy it is. But of course, we're dealing with a still water pond. So one solution that Tom came up with is instead of using an EPT, there's another index you can use, which is an ETO. So again, we're using the mayflies and uh, the caddisflies. And then the O stands for odonta, which are dragonflies and damselflies. And they're more common, of course, in our still water environments. So uh, yeah, that was really beneficial. So we could just swap it over because there's not a whole lot of resources when you're dealing with still wetlands, uh, especially Canadian resources. So it's hard to find. So we were incorporating different acts, uh, like aspects from like the US EPA and the, of course, cabin to sort of develop as best we could a standardized method. Uh, for the environmental assessment, we use an FBI, which is a family biotic index. And for change over time, we just use a general linear, general linear model uh, to measure those changes. So some of the results from our abiotic conditions. Uh, so of course, abiotic is uh, anything non-living. So from our pHs, we found it ranged from uh, 6.28 to 6.74, which is a good amount of you know, fluctuation in there. So of course, everyone knows, or you should know that, uh, since say you should know, but um, you might know that uh, distilled water is at a pH of seven. So this is just very, very slightly more acidic. And we also saw what was most interesting was a trend of downward uh, dissolved oxygen and temperature as we progressed from wetland one to wetland four. So as we saw the transition from wetland one to four, there was less oxygen in the water and it was getting hotter. And we also did find, we corroborated the evidence from the previous surveys 
that there was high levels of copper and aluminum in the waters, especially in wetland one and two. And we'll get to why that is in a second. So on a slightly uh, brighter note, we have some good news. Of course, there's lots of native, healthy and aquatic and terrestrial plants. You know, we saw the aquatic duckweed and uh, pondweed and star grass, which are all good things on site. And not only did they uptake metals, you know, it's, it's a good resource because, you know, birds can eat it and it also provides a habitat for amphibians and other vertebrates to like live in. And it was a previously disturbed site. So we did see a lot of, of course, red alders and cottonwoods on site, which is pretty typical for a site of that nature. And we did also see Himalayan blackberries, which are common with a disturbed site, of course, is a non-native invasive. I'm sure uh, Leanne, everyone can tell you about the big struggle it is with the blackberries on site. And another issue that we saw that might also be a solution is the narrow leaf cattail in wetlands three, which will be an important piece to the copper puzzle I'll get to in a minute. So here's a good graph of sort of telling you how there's a clear trend in increased species diversity as you're moving from wetlands one to four. Uh, it's not in orders of magnitude difference, but there is a clear trend that you can see that there is more diversity as you move to wetlands uh, four. And, but there's also a trend of increased uh, numbers of individuals that are, that we are catching in the diff nets in wetlands one and two. And that was primarily due to the sheer dominance of tolerant taxa, such as uh, Gamaris, which you can see here on the uh, far left, that's a freshwater shrimp and different midge species. So right below it here is a blood worm, it's a type of midge, and a uh, phantom worm or glass worm or plantain midge or glass worm, that's another type of midge. And so these are very tolerant to high levels of copper or high levels of other metals, you know, very poor water quality, low dissolved oxygen and that stuff. And as you transition to wetland four, we actually saw an increase in species diversity. So here we have a uh, giant water bug, which is another sensitive uh, taxa. And we have right beside them, we have a dragonfly nymph and right below there is some damselfly nymphs. So these were all very sensitive and we really only saw these mostly in wetlands uh, three and four, at least in any great number. So some quick results with the IBI and the pollution. So as I did mention, yes, there's more tolerant species in wetlands one and two and more sensitive species in wetlands three and four. So that leads us to believe that the water quality at least increases at some point in the chain. I should add that we didn't find any uh, significant amount of temporal difference between our two sampling time periods. And I should also add that we did have some mixed results. That was primarily when we used the EPT or the, yeah, the, yeah, the EPT and the FBI indexes because they're mainly for um, non still water uh, envir aquatic environments. So it was difficult for us to measure those. Uh, we did find that the ETO was probably the best measure for this site, at least. So overall, it appears that there is some healthy assemblages of invertebrates, despite the apparent low quality water. Um, some indicators of poor health that we did see, of course, mainly comes from comparing our site and using indexes that are really for streams and like for rivers, anything that's fast moving and has a lot of dissolved oxygen or even like larger wetlands. So the site is pretty unique and it needs a unique, you know, set of uh, like a unique analysis. Uh, the Shannon's and Simpson's index did, did uh, indicate a high diversity and the, so did the ETO index also corroborated that. And so ideally what we do here, if there's any further reset research on the subject is uh, we'll probably like to repeat uh, the, sub, the uh, survey again next year, but also compare with an intact wetland. So that would be a primary goal is if we could find a native wetland that uh, was previously undisturbed somewhere around here, and maybe on the island or up the coast, something like that, then we could sort of gain a perspective of what we should be seeing here. And that could be really beneficial to the research. So what do we learn? The invertebrate community seems healthy. There is low dissolved oxygen, 
but it's primarily probably because of there being low shallow pools and there's high copper levels, which as we know, can constrain some species, especially vertebrates. So sampling did provide some insight into the copper issue and it actually appears that the pump water that pumps into the four wetlands is actually clean. So the, samp the uh, contamination is probably coming from somewhere else. And as I did mention before, it actually appears that the water quality does get better as you go transition downward. So what happens? We theorize, we hypothesize that uh, the cattails in wetland three, although they are invasive, I will admit that, you know, the, they're narrow leaf cattails, we'll caveat on that. They actually appear to be removing the copper quite efficiently, I might add. So it's actually, that's why you're seeing such high amounts of diversity in wetlands three and four. Hmm. I'm just going to jump in there and add a little caveat, Harrison, yeah. which is that um, we don't know what's going on quite with the copper. It's, it's present when we've got the natural flow of water in the winter from overland flow. Yes. Then when we start the pump up for the summer months and the pump water floods through the system and turns over, it actually seems that the copper goes down then. So mm -hmm. The, we only see that that sort of cattail benefit before the pumps turned on. At that time, the cattails are taking the copper out, it seems, because the only place where we weren't seeing copper was where there was cattails. But the pump itself is generally just flushing the uh, wetlands clear. Yes. Now, the, the fact that the wetland four ended up being more diverse, and we saw that trend on diversity, we're not sure that's about copper. We think that's a lot more just to do with the size of those wetlands. So the wetlands get bigger and deeper. And so you just get more habitat diversity. And in fact, everyone who's been down to the site will know that that fourth wetland in the southwest has got much more openness. It's much deeper, and much bigger. And so as a result, it has greater species diversity and there's more evenness of those species. By contrast, at wetland one, we have low species diversity, and the ones we have are like really dominant and, and they're really tolerant of not great conditions. So that, that's the trend. We've got these great wetland down at the bottom, and we've got these not so good wetlands at the top. And we don't think it's necessarily the copper, we think it's probably more just to do with the the uh, fact that one is big and one's tucked away small and shallow. Yes. Yes, that is a good point. Yes, should add that too. Yeah, there's <laughs> much more, there's many more niches for uh, the different macroinvertebrates to, to occupy in wetland four because of the size of it. And again, is much more emergent vegetation. So uh, it's easier, you know, for there's more areas for them to hide. And uh, yeah, that was a good point. Thank you for adding that, Tom. So uh, in conclusion, some different advice that we have. So yes, at the top of the list, we do have resolve copper and contamination. We'd like to know where that comes from. And there's different uh, theories floating around. And then this one, of course, will open a discussion. Um, improving wetland depth and openness across wetlands one through three. So as Tom mentioned, uh, we did see a lot of diversity at wetland four. And that is, again, due to multiple things mainly the size and depth of it. And so, yeah, it brings us back to the theory of uh, island bi biogeography. If uh, you have a larger, you know, area, larger ecosystem, you can have more diversity. So should we be opening the wetland? Should we be making it wider? Should we be making it deeper? Uh, so you know, we can improve the environment. It would be very detrimental to the species that are currently living there. And, but theoretically down the road, it could be, uh, much more prosperous, but it's all about that detrimental stage and if we would want to do that. So that's going to open the discussion. Um, I don't know if I'm wholly for it, but it's worked in the past. So, yeah. And of course, we want to continue to prevent the, uh, the infilling and the pollution and retain the good health that we do have here at the Maple Flats Conservation Area. Uh, of course, there's a history of infilling and pollution, and that may be where the copper comes from. There might be um, some rubble pile that is, you know, letting off some copper or maybe runoff from the road. Yeah. And another one is we have to 
boosts the oxygen, at least for the verte vertebrates, the uh, primarily the uh, frogs and the salamanders that we have on site, you know, for them. And yeah. So before, as we finish up here, um, right before we take some questions, like to uh, acknowledge, give some acknowledgements here. Our work, of course, was undertaken on the traditional territories of the Soil Tooth Nation, and we thank them for allowing us to work on their lands, you know, their traditional territories where they would harvest uh, shellfish and uh, waterfowl. And uh, of course, we'd like to thank Wild Bird Trust for further facilitating uh, the field site access and guidance research goals, particularly. Uh, Leanne, thank you very much. Uh, your help was uh, invaluable on the subject, as well as Chloe, Chloe Hartley, thank you very much for that. And uh, the Habitat Committee and Research Subcommittee provided valuable guidance. And uh, this project was financially uh, supported by the Research Award from the Center of Research and Academic Scholarship at Capilano University. So thank you very much, Capilano. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure we'll take some now, but if they come to you later, here's some contact information for us. So you can reach either Tom or myself uh, at these emails here. And uh, yeah, if we move on to uh, Tom, if you wanna take some questions to facilitate that. Well, man, it's, it's your project. So I think it's awesome if, if you wanna answer those. I, I don't have too much more to add there. Um, if I can make one last comment, I think we found that the water quality wasn't great. And we found that those some of those wetlands weren't all that amazing. But I think that we kind of resolved that largely, maybe that's what's to be expected from little tucked away ponds. It's not yeah. that we've got terrible high pollution per se. It just mean may mean that that you know their maximum capacity is not all that great. And when we used all of these measures, which are designed for both blast flowing streams and also for really big wetlands, they're just not really relevant. You know, it's like saying, hey, this desert ecosystem isn't great because it's not the same as a tropical rainforest. You know, it, it's just, it's different, right? It's got its own different species, which are adapted to these smaller scale wetlands. And I think that's one of the things I, I noticed. Yes, yes, I'd agree. Cool, um, Sarah, do you wanna go ahead and ask some questions? Hi, yeah, um, I had a question about if you found any invasive macroinvertebrates. And thank you, by the way, for the presentation. It was very informative and interesting. Uh, you're welcome, yes. Uh, so we weren't necessarily uh, trying to gauge whether there were invasives on the site. Um, of course, there's very, uh, there's not a lot of information on what an invasive macroinvertebrate is since mm -hmm. they, have very short life cycles and they occupy so many different niches and you know there's such an area of flux it's hard for us to gauge but that would be something that i would like to look into in the future that would be that's actually a really good point thank you for that yeah i think yeah. i had a hunt i had a hunt around for some um for some of the so there's basically like if you look at all the major taxa of of invertebrates you know these early life forms there's one that's called the Nidaria and like that includes jellies, jellyfish, you know, in the ocean. And uh, there's a, a family in them which is called the Hydra, uh, Hydrozoans. And there's a, an invasive one in BC. And they often they look like little tentacled um, creatures stuck to the underside of lily pads. And those ones should be in there. I'd expect we'd have those in there as invasives, but I haven't seen them yet. So I just need to go digging around a bit more. So they're the bright green. They're only like a few centimeters long. Find yeah, in, most, yeah, yeah, they're teeny yeah. tiny little hydra, but I guess we were sort of sampling a net, so we weren't pulling in vegetation. We maybe missed that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a, that's an important thing I guess we should consider if we do something like this again. Mm -hmm. but yeah, we did see quite a lot of diversity, especially uh, something that was a little bit, I guess, expected, but I was a little bit surprised. We saw some flatworms. That was pretty cool. Um, just the sheer amount of those fingernail clams that we got that were only they're like this big, you know, just like real teeny tiny guys that you just pulling them out of wetland one that was really cool. Uh, and you don't realize, I guess it's hard to gauge, but uh, those dragonfly nymphs are actually, you know, quite large. When you get them and you pull them out of your net, they can be like that big. So mm -hmm. that can also quite startle you if you're pulling that out of your net. Just yeah. to uh, right. add on to that, um, uh, was it hard to identify down to like a, a species level? And did you sort of resort to having to just go to like a genus? Uh, uh, yes. Thing? So for a lot, we uh, even it was hard to even get to genus for a lot of them. 
because mm -hmm. they're such minute details and we were trying to cover a large amount of time. Each uh, individual sample, I was spending about 30 minutes sorting. And so a lot of the time we just uh, were lucky to get down to like class and family and just get down to that area. Um, yeah, there are very few species that we got down to um, in some cases genus, but yeah, it's very difficult when you're doing like such a large scale and I get to the point where it's like very minute details. You're like, uh, is the wing plate, you know, like two millimeters lower on this one? And, you know, you can't spend all day like measuring wing plates on dragonfly nymphs. So, yeah. <laughs> we, we definitely worked within uh, constraints. I should also point out that, you know, Harrison, you, you did a 200 level uh, invertebrate course. Mm -hmm. This was your first field project and it was in a second year of your degree program. Yeah. So um, contextually, uh, we worked within, I think, both of our expertise. I should also point out, I'm not an invertebrate zoologist per se. And in fact, what we discovered doing this project is that really expertise in that area is, is that there's, there's a paucity of experts generally who know their stuff. So this was definitely a, a first examination. It was an exploration of methods that we can use. And then we can try and institute that as we go forward at, at, at the wetlands, maybe improve this and um, try and find someone at Environment Canada who, who maybe be able to support us for a more in-depth study in the future. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. There was a question from Chloe, um, uh, who was asking about the influence of light on the wetlands. Um, so we did allude to that in the talk. But, um, Harrison, do you want to kind of clarify what you meant by canopy and how you're measuring that and compare the different um, wetlands and how maybe canopy and light would affect productivity and diversity? Yes. So uh, we measured canopy coverage uh, through an app where we would, for every transect, we did four or five transects per uh, wetland, is we would, uh, where we were standing, we would take a photo uh, above us and then that would give us a percentage of how much canopy coverage there was. And uh, of course, sunlight, uh, usually as, you know, take it back to the basics, you know, increased productivity because you're bringing more uh, energy into the system from, and then the primary producers can produce more into the secondary producers and get more uh, tertiary uh, consumers as you go on like that. Um, of course, another thing to remember is with the sunlight, we're also increasing the temperature and with increased temperature often means uh, lower dissolved oxygen. Uh, so we'll see different species uh, according to that. But yes, sunlight does of course play the major factor and that's uh, what Tom was mentioning uh, in the presentation as well, um, of why we saw so much difference in wetland for. And so yeah, that was a good question. Thank you, Chloe. I had um, another question I was just going to uh, address from Cora. Cora was asking whether we accounted for vertebrates in our invertebrate, sorry, vertebrates in our invertebrate index of biological integrity. So, you know, we, we kind of excluded them by doing it that way. But of course, we were doing dip netting, which has the potential to catch them. So I just wanted to make a brief comment, if I may. Um, so Cora, we did, we did capture uh, newts and tadpoles. Uh, we were working in June. Um, so those were present. What species did you get, Harrison? Um, it was hard. It's Primarily, we believe uh, Northwestern salamanders. So I think, I don't know if I can show that. Uh, so you see that they are still quite young and they have the gills there uh, right behind their head. And we also found some tadpoles on site, which we believe were some red-legged frogs. And we also did encounter a mature uh, rough-skinned rough newt on site. Okay, well. yeah. so that's cool. I, I think what we found there is that the abundance was relatively low. So mm -hmm. we didn't include them. They were very infrequent um, mm -hmm. and we didn't really have the adequate information to incorporate those into the comparable kind of uh, pollution tolerance indices. So, but I, I think it is worth talking about briefly. So I just wanted to touch on the fact that the wetlands generally have quite low dissolved oxygen. They've got quite a, a, a highly ac high acidity um, and they've also got this copper um, that's high. So we do have amphibians at the site. Chloe uh, would be the person to talk to about them. But I think what we were trying to do is talk to Chloe and feed her the information from this. Because low dissolved oxygen and, and acidity is a bad thing for vertebrates, both frogs and or fish. So the, the levels of acidity are touch and go for what vertebrates would really want to tolerate. They go down to about six pH 6.5. Below that isn't great. 
Um, copper is definitely bad, and their dissolved oxygen levels that they tolerate are around um, five milliliters per, per, oh God, I forget the units, but the, the number is five. Um, and the flats had sort of values of between two and three. So I think that that is a big constraint. Uh, we see more of the amphibians, I think, in Wetland 3, which maybe reflects the fact that that is the only place with a trickle in stream, which provides a little bit more aeration. And we even did a recent um, a recent capture for an invertebrate course at CAPU, where we just wanted to see what was present. And we found quite a lot of salamanders um, and, and, and hanging out right underneath that, that particular aerating stream. So I reckon if we wanted to boost them in our in our wetlands at the Maplewood Flats Conservation Area, we would might want to consider uh, the pH and um, oxygen levels. I just want to I'm jump in um, to pick up on what you just said, Tom. Um, thanks, Harrison. Great presentation. Thank nice you. and coherent um, and, and great, great delivery as well. Thank you. Um, the uh, in terms of Chloe raised the issue of light, um, the issue of uh, copper being reduced uh, when there's flow. So Tom and, and Harrison, what do we know about the issue of the water flow and um, looking ahead that, that we have a certain kind of a baseline with this initial work uh, now completed? What, what does this say or point us to in terms of how do we manage the flow? How, and, and, a, and a sidebar to that, uh, can planting uh, be one of the strategies around the pH? Uh, or is managing flow and is the key factor there? Uh, Tom, would you like to take this one? Uh, if, if you'd like. Uh, so pH could be just natural, just to let you know we're in um, what's called a podsolized soil regime here, which is a result of all these um, needle bearing trees. They make acidic soil. You get acidic soil, you're gonna get acidic water. So like I said, it's borderline. That might not be too much of an issue. And that wouldn't really be changed by using the pump. Uh, versus just having the typical overland flow. Then we come to oxygen. Oxygen would likely um, be increased to some extent by the pump, but I do feel by the time that water's hit wetlands, it's not really changing it. Um, we didn't see it causing a marked increase in dissolved oxygen anyway. So no, those two issues aren't really easily resolved. Um, they're kind of the norm for this kind of wetland. But let's get to the copper because that I think is a really big deal. So we know that the uh, whole of the MFCA is, is infill from uh, largely the downtown um, when they were rebuilding that. Um, and so as a result, you've got a lot of mixed material um, and I believe that's likely the source of the copper. And also we had aluminium that was quite high and, and generally the metals were a little high. So the fact that in, you know, before we turned on the pump, we took those water samples, we found that copper was higher than the advised levels for freshwater systems. So that's BC government's advised levels. It was higher than that. Then we turn on the pump, resample at the end of June um, and early July, and we find now that it's fine. Copper levels are below. So clearly something is in the, in the soils that's getting into those wetlands and increasing those levels. And I, I would suggest that that's all of this stuff they ripped up from the downtown and put in there. Mm -hmm. um, because that pumped water, I don't think is, is coming from that. It's coming from deeper, from groundwater. So it's, we're talking about seepage when it rains, runs through all that stuff at the surface and then drops into the ponds. So let's just have a last little chat about those cattails. So we sampled once before the pump and once after. Now in the before the pump sample, we had really high copper in wetland one, high in two, three was below the level for um, freshwater systems. So it was fine. How did that happen? We went one, two, bad, three, fine. And then you go to four and it's bad again. So clearly something in wetland three is going on. And that either, given that the water goes down from one to two to three to four, I'd suggest that those cattails, uh, actually Chloe uh, suggests that those cattails could be the, the solution there and that wetland four is, again, it's got its own runoff from its surrounding areas. So that's why the copper goes back up again there. I think that's really interesting for us to think about because it suggests we've got a broader soil problem. So to deal with the wetlands, we might do what we call bioremediation, which is plant things which suck the metals out of the water. And for the surrounding soils, we might want to try and find where the hotspots are for pollution. 
and maybe try and do something about that. Um, that's actually what they're doing right now in the firehole development across the road is searching the soil to try and find hotspots of pollution. If I could add something just to that, Tom. Uh, yeah. So yeah, one thing uh, that the 1994 Capilano College survey did find is they actually did test the soil for the debris pile. So if you've been on site, like once you come over the bridge, you know, right to your uh, to your right there, there's the massive mm -hmm. hill. That's actually a massive debris pile that has high levels of copper. So runoff from there could also be contributing. That makes a lot of sense. Um, that that particular deep debris pile. I think didn't actually come from the west uh, side. I think that one came from building the Pesk building. Um, but nevertheless, that doesn't exclude the possibility it's got a ton of copper in it. Um, because I think that the area where Pesk is was also, was that previously um, an infill uh, area? Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's just relocating some infill then. Yeah. So soil samples, that's the next step. <laughs> yeah. I think- and there is some, uh, forgive me, maybe Chloe can answer this. There is some work undergoing, am I not mistaken, with the uh, ECCC? Uh, it's, yeah, it's on pause right now, but they do plan to do some soil samples at some point to try to, uh, yeah, look into this, we hope. So we're all, all so Harrison, your work and, and that work, it all, all moves forward towards Better understanding, better solutions. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. All great. I love the idea of the bioremediation. If we can use um, plants as a means of uh, promoting removal of those toxins or, or even just controlling them because they're going to be an ongoing problem, that would be terrific. Um, Should we take another question? Yeah, does anybody else have any questions they'd like to ask? It in the can chat. be as... There's some uh, yeah, comments in the chat. Uh, Marissa, I think, has one. Let's see. Considering these wetlands are constructed by humans and have little to no maintenance, very interesting to see how the inhabits uh, shallow open water. It'd be interesting looking at the suite of predators. That's not seen out there. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a of course, uh, vertebrates, you know, they are a main predator. Um, I think our vertebrates or invertebrates are mostly sensitive to the water conditions though, uh, primarily. I'm not sure if Tom can speak to this, but yeah, the water conditions would most likely be affecting that, their diversity more than uh, what predators are in each pond. But it is, of course, yeah, it's good, it is good information to know of uh, what, yeah, predators, what predators so are Just where. to restate the, the question for everyone who maybe get, doesn't, doesn't have access to the chat. Uh, Marissa's kindly asking about how uh, these, these wetlands were created by us um, when we were um, restoring the site. So they're human created wetlands. They're very young. I think they were made in the mid to late nineties. Um, so uh, it's interesting that they've been recolonized by all these organisms. And we were just wondering what predators are actually gonna be present um, and what, so what's, what's being, what's living off these creatures that we're finding? So we should clarify, of course, that many of them are predators themselves. So dragonflies being probably our number one predator here, along with the, the water bug that we found. And so we've got quite a lot of the predators present uh, in wetlands uh, three and four, which is where we got more of those dragonflies and this, this water bug. Oh, and when we, we got the amphibians present as well, but we don't have much above that. Um, so they would make a big difference if they were included. If you put fish into this system, it would change everything. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing um, because that would impact amphibians and it would impact the, 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 the abundance and behavior of all of those other invertebrates. They'd become a lot more reclusive and their diversity would fall because they wouldn't be able to exploit the same kind of foraging options. Just think about it. It's like you, if you were, uh, living and carefree, and then all of a sudden we said, oh no, now there are lions living down in West Van. You probably wouldn't go to West Van so often. So that whole area of the city would be cut off to you. And that's kind of what would happen in these wetlands if we had more predators. Um, so it's, it, they have a mixed benefit, I would say. See, uh, Cora asked in the chat, how long has the pump been in the wet, or how long? Yeah, 
Uh, has the pump been in place? Do you know the reason for its installation? Yes, yeah, Erwin, thank you for answering that. Yes, it's to create a uh, water supply uh, throughout the summer months. Uh, so we want to keep the waters in the wetlands at a specific level. And once they fall below that, the pump is turned on then to pump water into all of the wetlands. And it's not so frequently turned on in the fall and winter and spring months, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure when it was put in. Maybe Erwin, you could answer that. I think we just replaced it after what, 20 years or 18 years of functioning? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I asked, I asked that earlier question, but I, got, I don't think I was poign poignant enough. Have we learned anything from this study or are we aggregating enough information to suggest that we have to be actually managing the flow? Because I think right now we have no rigor or no methodology for when the pump is turned on and turned off. Is that correct, Tom and Chloe? There, there is some degree of uh, method. Uh, of course, many will know we're in a change. Uh, the, the gentleman who was largely in charge of looking after the, the MFCA on a day-to-day -day basis um, is retiring. And his method was to turn on the water uh, pump each spring at the point when the uh, level of water started to decline and drop below that you know, baseline of the, the, the wetland fill. So, you know, in the summer, it would go up and maybe burst its banks a little, but if you started to see it fall below its bank side level, then he'd turn on the pump. And he would maintain pump to prevent that happening throughout the uh, summer months. So I guess the only way we might shift it is if we say, hey, the simple solution to resolve the copper problem is just for us to turn on the pump throughout the year intermittently and just uh, do what's called turnover. So replace enough of the water intermittently that we never get a buildup of much copper. So Marissa, Marissa asked a good question as well. Have bullfrogs been observed? Uh, Chloe, I think, would be the person to answer that one. I haven't seen any on site personally. I think not seen, not heard. No. So, which is fingers crossed, good thing. Thank you. And yeah, <laughs> those of you unfamiliar, yeah, bullfrogs, uh, native to the East Coast, um, invasive, very invasive here. They outcompete pretty much every other frog species. And uh, yeah, so. We've been lucky so far that we haven't seen any on site. Knock on wood. Yeah, as far as we know, bullfrogs were only just found on the North Shore a couple of years ago over by um, Ambleside in that sort of pond by uh, the mall over there. But they, yeah, they haven't been found on the conservation area. And I put in comments, I don't know if people saw, but the amphibian diversity kind of reflected your, your insect diversity findings where there was few egg masses and a, a not, I mean, there are only three different species found, but mm -hmm. um, at higher up there was just, there were none. And then there was Northwestern salamanders and tree frogs. And then in the big pond, there was red-legged frogs, tree frogs and Northwestern salamanders. Except for this year, we did find the red-legged frog in that very first wetland, which was very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. And that's a, Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. The issue of uh, just making a comment, um, in my role as a volunteer on the board, uh, I'm watching our organization build capacity, especially around the, the fact that we're having this conversation and Marissa's on staff and um, um, uh, we're, we're building more research methodologies and kind of systematizing our, our restoration goals. And I'm mindful that we haven't done a lot of active, serious restoration work. We've done very kind of passive restoration work. And um, with the loss of the forest across the way on the north side of Dollarton Highway, with the development of that area in the next five years, um, five to 15 years, our, uh, Chloe wrote a, a piece called Mountains to Mudflats, talks about con uh, contiguous uh, wildlife corridors, but also the other issue will be the biodiversity and intensifying the biodiversity. So what you're, what you're, sh what you're sharing today is really instructive because it, it helps us identify and argue for funding for what um, what might be seen as a low priority is okay we've got some biodiversity let's intensify it well well why do we why do we have to why, why don't we just take a lazy fair approach so we have these um, the, this moment in the next two three years where there's a con confluence of interests that will support our efforts to increase um, and 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 hit targets around uh, all the uh, the critter critter data and um, and these even these small issues like Chloe mentioned about the light or, or we were talking 
about water flow and copper uh, remediate uh, copper mitigating and and um, bio um, bio treatment of of through planting like all these are all hot button issues for us now that we actually could get funding for so it's really I just want to appreciate everybody for um, building up the the our capacity and also our knowledge bank so that we can actually in a in a year to actually put together some research proposals and restoration proposals. Thank you for saying that. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, just back to the chat, uh, Sarah mentioned uh, or asked, uh, you mentioned there weren't a lot of standardized Canadian wetland sampling methods. Uh, was that a challenge for you? Were you surprised about that? Um, yes, uh, it was indeed a challenge. Uh, of course, we did quite a bit of research uh, beforehand. So we didn't start sampling until early June and I was brought in in late April, early May, and it was pretty much a whole month of just writing the proposal and finding what standardized methodology we could use. So again, one of the main resources we had was CABIN, and that's the uh, Canadian Aquatic, um, is it Biomonitoring Invertebrate Network, something like that. That's uh, So they really, you know, that was the main foothold that we took. And then to help fill the gaps in that, we then went and used the uh, US uh, EPA guide that we could find about wetland uh, invertebrate sampling. Because a lot of the Canadian literature, at least that I've been seeing, was focusing primarily on streams and stream health. And so there's not a lot on wetlands. And Tom, you want to add to that? Oh, yeah, there's this. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think, like you say, Cabin's great. Um, there's some really awesome methods. And you may have heard of stream keepers on the North Shore. Like we know a ton about stream health. Um, and we have really good wetland assessment methods as well. And we've done some good monitoring on, on wetlands. But of course, this kind of small wetland, people don't tend to look at, they push it to the side. Uh, and so finding and identifying healthy ones with which to compare our one was challenging. In addition, all those uh, indexes of biological integrity, which we use to monitor streams. So we're like, we just go to the stream. Is it polluted? We pull out some inverts, see if there are some pollution intolerant species there. And if they are, then we think, great, okay, we've found that this is a healthy stream. You use those same criteria on a wetland, a still water wetland, and it doesn't work because all those stream species need a ton of oxygen. They're adapted to that kind of environment. And they're stream species. Like you don't get many stoneflies in a wetland. And so, I, I mean, I, I suggested the ETO. So like we just focus on finding these dragonflies and damselflies instead. That's actually not my idea per se. I just found it in the literature. And sure enough, it works way better. Uh, but some of the other suggestions don't work because they're all based on, you know, uh, it's like they give, for example, midges a pollution, a pollution tolerance score. But again, it, that's assuming that they're in a stream, not in a wetland. And so really, you know, this is a global thing. There just isn't really much known about what indicates pollution for an invertebrate that lives in a wetland. We shouldn't be measuring oxygen. What should we be measuring their tolerance to? Um, so yeah, that's, that's a broader beyond us and it's not something that we're gonna solve. Yes. Uh, any um, further questions from the chat? I'm going to echo um, Erwin's full, uh, thoughts there. I just really say, yes, this does provide some evidence-based approach, which we can use to really galvanize our uh, intentional restoration approach and, and really guide our applications for funding in, in terms of developing a goal that we want to achieve and therefore what we're going to go and seek help funding. Um, and we can take that forward with the Habitat Committee uh, and I know that um, suddenly this is integrating into a lot of other information which has been acquired by other research projects on the MFCA, by BCIT students, for example. And so, yeah, it's it's great that we can use it now as a, as a weapon in our arsenal, so to speak. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a big thank you to Harrison. Harrison, you're a marvelous student. Terrific, fun supervising you, and thank you for doing so much work on behalf of CAPU and especially on behalf of the WBT um, and for bringing us a story of what's happening in the wetlands. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your guidance, Tom. I really appreciate it. There's some, there's some hairy moments there, but you really uh, helped me through. And thanks again, Leanne, for all your support. And thank you, Chloe, you know, for all your guidance. I really appreciate it all.
And thanks, for, Erwin, for your insight there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll echo the thank yous, but also to Tom for bringing in the, the funding to bring um, Harris's, Harrison on site and to do this important um, work. And I uh, appreciated being able to provide you with support uh, with some COVID protocols that we had to kind of maneuver around and providing kind of an imperfect lab setting for you. Um, so that you could do this good work. Um, it's it's uh, really a good foundation for future um, things and building on, on other student work that Chloe has helped to bring through BCIT. And so, um, and also just wanted to note to anyone on, on our um, call here that uh, we're, while we're trust is also in the, in the process of um, hiring new s interns. Um, so if you check our website, uh, wildbirdtrust.org, um, we have a we hiring like jobs page on there. Uh, we've got a restoration technologist, a digital communications position. Um, uh, we've we're anyway. So there'll be some, there might be some new ones because we're we've got a couple other applications out, and uh, looking forward to building this team to to support the good work of the habitat committee, and um, and and the other work that we're doing. Cool. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Thanks, Thanks for Alice for your support um, getting these going. <laughs>